indie games have been absolutely dominating the 3D platforming genre as of late. Yeah, the big budget stuff may give you the oohs and ahs, but if you really want to find the games with the most unique ideas and, in some cases, even the most impressive gameplay, well, then you gotta be looking for the indie games. Last year, I talked about a handful that I thought were really cool, and uh, that ride is far from over. These things are still coming out like mad, so I figured, hey, why not talk about a handful more? I mean, some of my favorite games last year came out of this scene. So, I guess here's volume two of me talking about a whole bunch of cool three indie indie platformers that I thought were real neat and let you know what I think of them. Uh, most of these are going to be rather new games just from the past year, but in these videos I would also like to include ones that have been out for a long time because it's a good excuse to catch up on some stuff I missed. So without further ado, here's a bunch of cool ass 3D platformers that have been cooking in that independent oven. This year I'm coming out swinging dude because we're starting with one of my favorite 3D platformers ever made. This was my single favorite video game of last year. It just left me remarkably impressed in so many different ways. This is the Banjo-Kazooie spiritual successor because it aims to not only embrace, but enhance that hazy N64 look and feel we've all come to love so much. And it's not all just talk either. No, it ain't all just for show. This game knows how to walk the walk. It also thoroughly understands the scrappy playground nature of open-ended platformers, and it creates one of the most alluring platforming worlds I have ever had the pleasure of getting lost in. Corn Kid 64. It may not actually be on the N64, but I really do think this is the best N64 game ever freaking made. We follow Sev, this adorable little mutant goat guy that's having another one of his weird ass dreams. Oh, sweet. It's the Nacho Dream. Hey, well, there's Nacho and Borium. Sure, let's go dig in. I really love this character so much. Like, right away, he is just bursting with personality from his laid back attitude to that, like, the ridiculously expressive animation and everything. And oh my god, this gas station. I love this gas station. What a good hub world. The glowing green vending machine and everything, wow. I'm not even at level one yet, and I already love this thing. <laughs> well, nachos are waiting for us, so hey, let's go in already. Much to Sev's disappointment, uh, the entire interior has been gutted, nachos and all, by his weird friend Alexis. Yeah, she replaced the entire Nacho Emporium with a big playground platforming level. Dream Logic's a jerk. <laughs> Either way, Sev is not very happy about this at all. He wants his freaking nachos, and he's gonna do whatever it takes to get this stupid dream to supply them. And before we know it, we're jumping around and doing some platforming, so yeah, uh, much like Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie and many of its contemporaries, you basically do everything by using a combination of your main three buttons, your jump, your attack, and your crouch. So yeah, you know, your, your two face buttons and the trigger. Lots of familiar moves here executed in familiar ways. You know, your ground pound for bopping buttons and you know, getting more bounce out of bouncy stuff, maybe breaking something. Crouch and then jump to do a high jump. But this is more of like an inverse ground pound for slamming upwards. Also a little ram move used for attacking, uh, but mostly knocking things open or away. If you do it while moving, you'll launch yourself forward a little bit. Kind of good for attacking guys, I guess. Combat is always simple and quick, but it has very satisfying animation so it's fun to do. Uh, it kind of feels like we're looking at what goes on inside the cartoon dust cloud, you know what I mean? Very chaotic and fun, but never waste your time with it. Now, pressing attack in the air is what's going to give you probably the most important maneuver you have. This little, uh, air dash ram thing? I don't know, but you can do a hell of a lot of things with this. Smack yourself into a giant screw and twirl it all around. Unscrew it and it comes out and reveals something inside. Or maybe you're winding up some sort of mechanism. Maybe a giant clock for like a puzzle or something. It can also be used as a, as a sort of homing attack. Now, it's not like Sonic. You're not going to zip right to the guy and be able to go boom, boom, boom or anything. But if you do it in front of an enemy or maybe an obstacle that you want to bounce off of, it will hone in a little bit, and from there, you'll be able to do it again and again, chaining it into a long combo. You can also just do this on a wall, just ram and do it and jump off, though you won't be able to do it over and over like you can with enemies or certain obstacles. This is more so ramming into a wall jump, and buddy, this wall jump is where this game starts to get really impressive. 
Now you know me, I've played a bajillion platformers, wall jumping is my favorite move, and most of them are fake. Most wall jumps are not real. Automated, magnetized, do it all for you, mash the button, it plays itself, I hate that shit. Very few games have ever managed to make a good wall jump. It is one of the rarest things to see in a platformer, so imagine how messed up it is when this random game comes out of the ether from some dude nobody's heard of out of nowhere. And bafflingly so, it has the single greatest wall jump I have ever seen in my life! Okay, I know I've said this about games before. I've said this multiple times. They can't all be the best, I know. But so far, this is my favorite one, and I'll just explain why so maybe you can see if if you think it's as good as I do. So check it out. When you jump at a wall, Seb's gonna press up against it and slide down. I guess similar to Mario Sunshine, that's probably the closest thing I have to compare to here, but the fall is a lot more aggressive, and you've got a lot more control over the left and right. Even just jumping into the wall right away, you've got so much control over over that wall slide, so even with just the setup, you already got a lot of control over this. Jumping during the slide animation is gonna have Sev vault in the direction that you hold the stick, of course. Though the way it works, it's almost like there's two different types of vaults. If the camera's aimed right at the wall, then you can very easily fling yourself alongside that surface. Flinging yourself straight up, maybe to grab a ledge up there, or you can fling yourself over to the side. Now, if you don't have the camera aimed right up against it, it's also very easy to vault just straight up away from the wall, just doing a straight up normal wall jump. Man, out of all the ones I've used so far, this has got to be the wall jump that's got the most utility. You always got to get crafty with it, whether you're just doing a regular obstacle or maybe you're doing some tricky dicky bullshit to skip up to like a, like a pipe a little faster. Now, it can feel a tiny bit weird at first because you really do have to commit to the action of pressing against the wall. Mario Sunshine, it kind of gives it to you, but here, you have to push that stick long enough to make that action occur each time. Otherwise, you might not actually get the wall jump out of it, but once you've got them stuck in place, once you've got used to getting them stuck in place, you then have maximum control over that vault. All you gotta do is play with the angle a little bit, and the game is pretty damn good at figuring out which direction you're trying to go towards when you're holding the stick. It's like, wow, this is the first wall jump I've ever used that feels like it's interested in both the 2D and 3D planes evenly, and the player's ability to lock and pull away from either or, it's just, again, like it takes a little bit of practice, sure, but it feels absolutely absolutely incredible once you get the hang of it. And what's wrong with a little challenge, huh? Like, I love that. No, I need that! I had to actually get kind of good at this before I was able to do most of this game. And that is that magic layer of gymnastics-like challenge that Mario 64 always had, that Banjo and all of its contemporaries never, ever quite replicated. Not even close. So to have a game that literally, actually, gets the best of both worlds is like kind of mind-blowing playing something like this. And and of course, combined with that little dash move, it feels like, ooh, I just got that, and it was up to me to execute those moves in order, and I feel like I did something. This game, every time, I feel like I did something. So take your automatic wall jumps and throw them with a garbage Pac-Man World 3. Suck my freaking crack hole, Crash Bandicoot 4. Get that fake ass wall jump out of my face, Scratchin' and Clank. This is how it's done. And we're not even done, it only gets even more impressive when you realize how freaking seamlessly all of these platforming mechanics mesh into the game's excellent climbing system. So, you know, basic Mario 64 shit, you just jump at the pole, lock to it, climb up, climb down, rotate, jump towards the direction the character's sticking off. Which is nothing new, but they also do new things with it. Uh, there's all these horizontal poles that you can swap between hanging off of and walking on top. Uh, like the pole climbing, you are also locked to the pole. Uh, it actually kind of reminds me of Sly Cooper a little bit, but it's nowhere near as magnetic or automated. In fact, this is the perfect amount of magnetism. You can always do it comfortably. It never feels like, oh, I should have landed on that. No, you always get it. But it also always feels like you actually did it. You didn't just hit triangle and the game just landed there for you. You know what I mean? And it don't even stop there. There's also these uh, uncharted like grapple points that you can either hang or stand on top of, just like the poles. Uh, you know when like Nathan Drake's in place and you get a moment to reach out and do your little leap? Sort of similar, but again, without the automation. They basically just give you a worry-free vault. You know, it's the same action you do out of that slide, except except you got way more time to stop and consider your next move. 
These are often used for linking the obstacles in a long platforming sequence, and buddy, there's some cool freaking obstacles here. There's rings that launch you forward, arrow buttons that grant you a super wall jump, bubbles you can bounce from, the enemies that you have to carefully look at and bounce off of those, even just ledges have a lot of utility. There is so much going on with the gameplay and stage gimmicks here that they can string together so many sick-ass platforming sequences that are entrancingly satisfying to pull off. Dude, I am being incredibly sincere when I say that this game, this is one of my favorite controlling platformers I have ever played. This is a masterclass in how to make a little guy move. And that's just the tutorial stage, dude. The real meat of the game takes place in the wonderfully kooky little town of Wallow's Hollow, a place of pigs and palindromes. Many of the town's mysteries lay within the reversible nature of the world around you. Very quickly, you're gonna notice a lot of stuff you can't do yet, but there's so many things to check out, from major mechanisms that open doors or tweak obstacles, to tiny pieces of the world that you can rip open and get some experience points. And that's what you're looking for here, experience gems. Instead of the usual, get a bunch of big collectibles, open more levels structure, Corn Kid sticks with one modestly sized, but densely bundled world with these little doors everywhere that you need a certain level to open up. The more experience you find from both the little things and major objectives, the more areas you'll be able to access, the more things you can unlock, the more things you can tackle, the more items you can grab, the more stuff you can do. It all just comes together so freaking well. There's so much going on here, and a lot of it is tucked away so brilliantly that you'll be having more and more realizations by the minute. And it is all so delightfully charming with such an incredible visual style. I mean, you know, it's, it's going for the retro look and it does it really, really well, sure. But it's the character design and animation that really make it stand out. Sev carries with him so much personality, and the writing isn't half bad either. It actually managed to get a healthy amount of chuckles out of me. I'm kind of sensing a little bit of uh, maybe Invader Zim influence here. The style even comes across in the dude's comics. Apparently he's been drawing them as far back as 1999. Oh, that predates them. Okay, well, maybe not, but I, I guess that's how I describe the visuals and humor if I, like, needed a quick example. Definitely less annoying, though. No offense to Zim. I do recommend checking out this guy's website, though, BOGO Zone, because the comics alone are just absolutely ridiculous. They don't make any sense at all, but they're just so absurd. You just have to keep clicking to the next page to see where it's going, and it, it doesn't ever really go anywhere, but you, you just have to keep clicking and clicking and clicking until, until the shit just kind of ends. Also, don't worry if none of the uh, retro filter stuff does anything for you, because you can't just turn it all off. Uh, in fact, you've got a lot of options here. You can really customize the look, which is sick, because I do like the low-res look, but not so much the CRT filters, so I appreciate the amount of control you do have over it. Besides, if I want the CRT experience, I'm gonna go all out. Get yourself one of these, they're dirt cheap on eBay. Uh, it will squash the picture together, though, but you can fix that pretty easily by stretching it back out. And the game even encourages you to use an actual N64 controller, which is pretty cool, so I uh, Get yourself one of these USB converters. I don't have one, but I do have a Mayflash adapter and Rafna cables and wow, yeah, this just kind of worked. <laughs> Remapping the control is a bit of a nightmare. Uh, God bless Steam's virtual input, but it does come with a chair of headaches. Uh, but hey, eight minutes of finagling later and I'm practically playing Corn Kids off the N64. Now this is playing with power. Figured I may as well try an actual GameCube controller too, and had to remap a few things, but this is actually a really good way to play this. I posted both of my control schemes up on the community thingy. I can't guarantee they're perfect, but hopefully that'll help anybody using a Mayflash. And if you don't give a shit about doing things old school, you can just use a modern controller. And you can also just go full HD too, widescreen even if you want, and there's even a way to get the game playing at 60 FPS, so you can be playing clean Kid 64. <laughs> kind of feels like the Banjo remaster on Xbox. God, I wish more 64 games would get that kind of treatment. If I'm being honest though, it does control best with a modern controller, so I did find myself going back to the old PS5 one when the game really did start getting tough, and my inputs had to be all the more precise. The post-game challenge stages are just bonkers, dude. They take that moveset, they take these obstacles, and they make something ba 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 man as hard as a big fun final challenge, and holy sh sh dude, this is the kind of th this is a rewarding ass level to feel like you get after doing everything else. Corn Kid 64 is a platformer for the die-hard collectathon platforming fans. The experience 
experienced ones that want good, well-designed challenge that's both familiar and fresh as heck. From the nuanced movement, to the cryptic puzzle solving, to the absolute batshit ridiculous quest to getting 100% completion. Getting everything in Gorn Kids is not for the faint of heart, it's for the people that can do DK64 blindfolded and can find every microscopic needle in the densest haystack yet. There's stuff hidden so well in this game, it's the hardest, corest of scavenger hunts. Don't feel too pressured to do it though, the regular ending is really satisfying. The post-game 100% stuff is just for the hardcore fans that really want this sort of thing. Most people are not going to do this, but if you end up loving this thing to death like I do, it's got the potential to become that one magical game that you finally complete after years and years of coming back to it and researching these levels that you've come to know like the back of your hand and finally noticing, oh my god, this tiny little thing that slipped through my fingers the whole time! This may just be one of the most James games I've ever played in my life. The only thing that can make it better for me is if it had tank control sections with survival horror combat. <laughs> but no, no, for real, like, this game actually mashes together Mario and Banjo in a way I have not seen done before. And with so much originality on top of that too, it's like, wow, you really made one of my favorite things. So, thank you so freaking much for making this thing. Right now, the game's only on Steam, but if the guy knows any better, he's gonna get this thing on Switch as soon as possible because this needs to be playable as easily as possible by as many people as possible. It is super cheap, too. It's like, what are you doing, cheap? It's only $7! I can't believe this thing only costs this much! I mean, I guess it is pretty short. You can probably beat it in just, like, four to six hours, even shorter if you know what you're doing. It absolutely left me wanting a lot more, but, you know, at the same time, it's really replayable. And I don't really think games need to be big to feel complete and fulfilling, and again, really hard to complain with how cheap it is. Now, I can see this game not being for everybody. It is demanding of both precision and patience, but hey, that's why we're talking about a whole bunch of games today, so why don't we see what else we got? Next up, we got a pretty zany one. This game right here is for those cracked out platformer fans that just want to go on the controller. Orbo's Odyssey by developer Fever Dream Johnny. This was one I kept seeing on Twitter a lot last year. I came out back during last summer, but I never got the chance to play it until now. You play as Orbo, a funny little guy who's locked in his boss's office at work with his co-worker Peebs, this uh, little nose Turn guy. Nose. And since neither of them have arms, neither of them can reach the doorknob and leave. <laughs> so we have to go on a big old funny quest through our employer's bizarre factory building in order to find enough cogs to build that arm and get the hell out of here. Gameplay in this one is really freaking fun. Uh, it's one of those games where there's not really a whole lot going on, but it all bounces off of each other so well that you are just slamming together move after move after move and bolting through every environment at mock freaking speed. Nothing can stop you. So check it out, you got your jump and you got your duck. And that's it. Those are your two buttons. Those are the only two things you can do. Everything else is just a combination of these. You got your classic high jump. You hold down the crouch button and then jump. Orbo will jump up into the air and turn into a little helicopter for easy landings. This is your precision move for when you want to slow down and like just land on something. Now pressing duck midair will have Orbo slam back down into the ground. This is great for quickly getting your footing again so you can have that crazy combo going, going, going. But it's also good for sliding around. You can spam it and Orbo will just slide and slide. Uh, this is like your medium speed move for when you want to get around quickly, but not like ridiculously fast. Now that comes from Orbo's signature bullet move. Pressing the jump button again in midair will have Orbo boom forward at nutso speed, just blasting through the air. You'll continue flying forward in the direction you're aiming the camera at. So that's really how you control yourself here by aiming that camera. Uh, your airtime only lasts a little while though. So it's more like a guided glide than it is straight up flying and that's where those quick landings come in to reset your airtime to launch again and again. And there's a handful more actions like a wall jump you don't really use much and you can also bounce out of that little uh, the slam slide thing. But for the most part, that's really all you have to work with. The gameplay loop here is remarkably simple. Yet, it is still so unbelievably fun anyway because of the ridiculous rate at which you can perform these actions. This is like instant gratification bullshit right here, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not really doing a whole lot, but it tickles your brain so damn well that you just keep on playing. 
Now, since controlling that glide successfully requires always moving the camera, you're going to want to make sure your thumbs are usually on the sticks as much as possible. So with that in mind, the dev here also stuck these two actions on the shoulder buttons. I remember Fabraz, the Demon Turf dev, talking about this on Twitter. It's weird to challenge our familiarity with control schemes. I mean, like, if A's been jump since Mario Bros, I'm going to want jump to be on the main face button because that's what I've been used to for 25 years. Even if there is a totally practical benefit to the change, it can still be hard to want the change anyway, so having it mapped both traditionally and practically, well that's a great way to ease people into performing actions in a slightly new way. And that's exactly what my experience with this game was. I don't want to jump with R1, what are you making me do that for? I want to jump with X, that's what I'm used to, I'm jumping with X, screw you. But after I struggled with the camera flow just enough times, I found myself using it more and more, relying on it more and more, getting used to it more and more until I'm full on shoulder buttons now and I'm flying through these levels with way more accuracy. Because you know, a big part of video game design is playing with the psychology of the player and trying to challenge what they currently want from a game and figuring out how to get them where you want them to be. So hey, I just gotta say, Fever Dream Johnny doing some good ass game design right here. As for the levels themselves, well, the mechanics here kind of look like you would be tackling linear track-like stages like a Sonic game or something, but every level here is more akin to the open-ended objective-based gameplay of uh, like a Banjo-Kazooie game. To find each of the five gears, you'll wander every bizarre liminal map, looking for tons of different things to do. Uh, for instance, here there's a locked door with these two big shapes, so you have to find this big machine and just slamming yourself into the buttons, you gotta figure out that you have to make a key. You'll also meet a bunch of strange characters and do some silly stuff for them. Uh, these rubber ducks are at war over a giant lawn gnome, so you have to launch a nuke at it. Uh, this office worker here, he's gonna be shot in the face by a sniper if they leave their post because this company is just that awful. So you have to go get their lunch for them or they'll starve. And those snipers are real, dude. Like, if you go up into the canyon, they're gonna shoot you too! But that made me wonder, what are they hiding? What is out there? You get a time limit, can I find something within that? And that's when you start uncovering the real weirdo shit. As you uncover the secrets of the company, we peer into the mystery of the cultural zeitgeist. This idea that preserved ideas can leave the collective consciousness of the many and pour into the quarks and atoms of the quantum world, manipulating reality in an algorithmic, Lego-building, Mandelbrot fashion. This is why many parts of this factory are these strange, nonsensical worlds. As if an AI or something had, had a lot of knowledge of human concepts, tangible ideas like chairs and buildings, but generated it in a way that does not serve any human purpose whatsoever, in a way that's just nonsense. Now, I don't know if that's what they're trying to get across, but that sure as hell is a cosmic gumbo I'm eating when I read stuff like this, but whichever way you interpret it, the mystery behind this company is surprisingly gripping, and it serves as an incredible backdrop to all the fun gameplay and humor and everything. Now, with only a handful of actions that you kind of do repeat over and over, as fun as they are, eventually the gameplay does start to feel a little bit repetitive. But it's not like you're going through like a 12-hour game with this. This game only took me about three hours to complete and even get the hidden ending too. It's definitely not something that even comes close to overstaying its welcome. And with how you can replay levels to try and beat your best time and the level mod support and everything too, this game is super replayable. And you know, it's also sort of hard to complain in general because this game is cheaper than a fartin' dick. In fact, the entire game is just a silly little side project that Dev is making to fund his more ambitious game, Nowhere Michigan. And it looks delightfully surreal. So. If Orbo looks like your kind of kooky weirdo fest full of fun and surreal silliness, well, you get a dope-ass platformer and you also get the fun something pretty rad. So if you've got that busy brain that loves drilling your fingers into the buttons like a jackhammer, Orbo's Odyssey is the juice you want to be drinking. Also, totally worth checking out the dude's existing library too, because those games have a very similar dream space style to them, so you're likely to enjoy them as well. Uh, Peebs even has his own game, oh my god. Peebs. He's not a- he's not a nose, he's a- he's a penis. <sighs> So one of the most common comments I always get whenever I talk about indie games that are currently just on the computer is a bunch of people wishing they weren't just on the computer, asking me if I know if it's going to come to a console someday. Now, I do agree that the PC is the best way to give you the most control over the games you play, from the input variety to the button remapping to even mod support. But the fact of the matter is that most people just don't seem to prefer playing games at a desk, or don't have the means to, or maybe they don't have a convenient device to play computer games on. 
from what I've gathered from reading my comments over the years is that most people see, okay, well, most people who watch these videos seem to prefer playing on Switch and PlayStation. So I figured it'd probably be a good idea to include a little update section in these videos that let you know when games I've covered previously that used to be just on the computer finally come to more platforms. Last year I talked about a game called Sephony, a cavern exploration parkour game with pretty unconventional controls, but they made for very creative platforming. Very different, definitely one of my favorites from last year's video. And if you missed out on it before, it's now available on Nintendo Switch, PS4 and 5, and Xbox. This guy is now on everything. This is a game for the core-ass platforming fans that want movement and level design that is experimental and different. Yet, once you wrap your head around the controls, you're going to be tackling some very inventive obstacles. It's an analgesic productions game, the creators of Anodyne, so you can expect a lot of surreal stuff that'll give you those tender emotions, dropping concepts that'll leave you thinking about it for a long time. I'm still thinking about it now. It's about 20 bucks, which isn't bad if you ask me, so hey, I'm once again recommending it. Just uh, try to think of the sprinting controls like doing a wall ride in a Tony Hawk game. Don't think of it like tank controls, think of it like Tony Hawk controls. I find that can help if you're uh, struggling to wrap your head around it a little bit. And that's all I have for updates this time, but hopefully next year and years to come, there will be more stuff coming to more platforms. Oh, here's a really cute one I first played a couple of years ago. It's called Castle on the Coast. You play as this doofy giraffe guy named George, and you're plundering a castle full of little kids. Yeah, so I guess a long time ago a bunch of wizards inhabited this castle, but long ago they went to deal with some sort of massive problem, save the world or something, but after which they never returned, vanishing into the ether and leaving their offspring behind. Now the castle is populated with children, and there's this conflict between everybody and these two wizard kids in charge. Pick up the books, or I turn you and your friends into popsicles. Maybe we should just do what he says? Uh, uh, yeah, Miles, I just hang around you to look cool, not get frozen. So it's now up to George to collect a whole bunch of bullshit and help these kids settle the differences. So the first thing you're probably going to notice about this game is just how floaty the jumping is. Your character does feel like they have weight, like when you land there is a good sense of footing, but like being airborne feels like you're on the moon or something. Feels like you're a balloon softly coasting through the air. Moveset is pretty straightforward, you've got a basic double jump as well as that uh, Mario 64 thing where jumping three times in a row gives you more height in the third jump, but unlike Mario you don't have to have a running start, this you can just do from a standstill. There's also a wall run slash wall jump, if you jump into a wall you can press yourself alongside it and with how floaty the jumping is you can actually really like bumble dick your way up some of these walls, I don't think that's intentional but <laughs> it's fun to do. We've also got a dive button, though I don't really find it all that useful, it doesn't really make you go all that much further and the roll you do out of it. While it can be fun rolling down slopes sometimes, I generally found the rolling too sluggish to really bother with most of the time. You can also find a jetpack pretty early on, which you can then switch to at any time with a circle button, or whatever button you're playing this thing on, probably B or something, I don't know. I'm playing on PS4 right now. This is great for gliding forward and for catching yourself when you slip, but you can't double jump while it is equipped, so there's a little bit of a trade-off when you switch back and forth. I love how it feels to swap to it midair. Um, you know that feeling of switching to the hover nozzle just in time in Mario Sunshine? Kind of like that, a little easier, but it's a similar type of challenge. Having to bounce between modes like this makes getting the longest jump possible require a little bit of deliberacy, so uh, even with how floaty and forgiving the jumping is, it's not like you're just mashing a bunch of buttons and it's just doing it all for you. You know, playing this game is kind of like playing with a balloon. You know, it, it's not hard. It falls so slowly that you have so much time to run and catch it. It's so simple a child could do it. You know, at every birthday party you see kids doing this, but just because it's easy doesn't mean it's not kind of fun. And also every now and then, you really gotta run and catch yourself. It's simple, it's not that demanding, but it's not so easy that it's just playing itself and you never really have to make a careful action. That's kind of how it feels playing Castle on the Coast. 
It is overall certainly geared towards kids, so I wouldn't really blame anybody if they found it too slow or, or not engaging enough. But with how much you can still do with these floaty, pudgy movement options, I actually still had a lot of fun exploring the moveset, and by extension, exploring every map, grabbing everything I could find. So, you know, in true collectathon fashion, that's really what you're doing here. You're exploring every map and trying to pick up every collectible you see. There's all these little uh, rose petal bubble things that you can use to buy more costumes. That's always super fun. But what you're really going to be looking for here are these big guys. Yeah, now these are the golden bananas. The, uh, you know stars or jiggies. The thingy open sesame. And uh, sometimes you'll do the occasional puzzle. Uh, I love this part where you have to pluck these mushrooms to make a potion of the right color so you can open the door. But it really is like 90% just jumping around and picking stuff up. There's vehicles you can find, maybe a submarine or balancing on a ball. The rocket car is super fun. If you've played a lot of Outer Wilds, you're gonna very quickly be using this thing like not at all the way they want you to, but like ooh. Propulsion. And you gotta love a platformer that has actually really good swimming controls. You gotta swim up button and a swim down button, just like Mario Sunshine, nice and simple. And you go pretty fast too, so I never found myself annoyed anytime I had to explore underwater. No, it just felt like a great change of pace and a great change of setting. Now, while the main stages are pretty easy going, it's the dream levels where the challenge ramps up a little bit. I love this one area where the visuals are so distorted and you're really second guessing where the platforms even are before they slowly fizzle into reality as you get closer. A very creative way to get a little bit of challenge out of such a floaty character. For the most part though, it is very much a casual platformer and you know, that's okay sometimes. Maybe you just want something nice and relaxing to go through or maybe you're looking for something that's easy for your kid to get into and Castle on the Coast really fits that bill. This game is just such a joy to look at. I love the visual style here so freaking much. The way every texture looks like it was hand and drawn with crayons, it's got such an innocent charm to it, which is pretty fitting considering the setting. The music and the choice in colors too, it actually sort of reminds me of Rayman 3 in a weird way. You know how it's all enchanting and fairy tale like but with that modern dash of stupidness. I mean, George here, they made him look dumb as hell. The, the big poopy googly eyes and the little tongue stuck out. They made him look as dumb as possible and I would not have had it any other way. He's pretty adorable, I'm not gonna lie. The story here was also a really big surprise. When you first start the game, most dialogue isn't much more than like quips or non sequiturs. You may see me struggle, but you will never see me quit. Are you lost too? <laughs> Great voice acting. Oh, why is that bird pooping on me? Excellent question. It's a lot of goofy and weird stuff, but the more you get into it, the more you start unraveling a lot of hinted at history here. The parents, how they all left, and how it affected these kids, how they were all abandoned and had to figure things out on their own. It's a wholesome lord of the flies. Kids button heads, trying to make sense of change, the newfound independence after the people you rely on disappear, and ultimately discovering that you're not at your strongest until you finally discover how to communicate. It's a really heartfelt story, and it even gets sort of emotional at times, but there is plenty of good silliness along the way to keep the mood from ever getting too somber. I love how Vendrick's too lazy to figure out your name, so he just calls you Bob the whole game? He calls you Bob for like no reason. Look Bob, I don't like you, and you don't like me. Bob? What are you doing here? Bob? George? George? George! Oh, it's a delightfully goofy game that knows exactly when and when not to take itself seriously. It's easy to tell a lot of heart went into it. You'll get a lot of wholesome, innocent laughs out of it, and while it probably won't challenge you that much and may even feel a bit too slow for you, it does make for a very relaxing and wonderful experience. It is kind of short. It only took me about three hours to beat, though that's not 100%ing it. Maybe you could get a little more, but yeah, either way, maybe wishlisted 
can wait for a sale if you want, but I do overall recommend it if you want a, a casual experience, or maybe if you have a son or daughter or a niece or nephew you'd like to play with. There's also a neat little two-player co-op mode, uh, kind of disorienting for player two since the camera continues following just player one, but there are some visuals in there to help a little bit, and I love how player two can make these platforms, these bouncy platforms, so I can see it being fun as long as the uh, players cooperate. That is the moral of the story after all, so I'd say that makes a lot of sense. <sighs> And the last one we're talking about today is another one I loved from last year. A cute and somber platformer called Cavern of Dreams. Yet again, the N64 proving its immortality. While Corn Kids leans into the chaotic humor and animation, this is something that harnesses the hazy lo-fi visuals and soft sound and really tries to make something that feels like a nostalgic dream. Atmosphere is front and center here. Not only do the models and environments absolutely nail the N64 look, but it also embraces the many aspects of it that were always evocative of those estranging emotions. Like uh, like when you get to a part of an N64 game that's like sort of unintentionally creepy, or maybe something about it feels a little bit off. Not to say like the game's trying to be scary or anything, no, far from that. It's more like the ambient void that comes with games like Yume Nikki or Interior World. It's foreboding, but non-threatening. Things being a little bit estranging just adds to the mystery, plucking your curiosity as well as giving you those things that you love. It is a game with restraint, though. Uh, they don't do that all the time. For the most part, the game carries a pretty joyous mood. Characters are supportive and optimistic. Even characters that look like they should destroy you are often pretty friendly. But who's gonna want to be mean to such a cute little dragon dude anyway? I mean, I mean, we're playing as Finn the baby dragon. This guy's just adorable. All of his siblings have gone missing, and it's now up to him to scour a bizarre world world of dreams and collect as many of his unhatched brothers and sisters as he possibly can. When you first start, you won't really be able to do a whole lot, you just have a basic jump and a little roll move, but they do make sure to start you at the top of a slope right away, so immediately you can see exactly how your first move reacts to things. That's pretty good game design right there. You will unlock more moves as you collect those dragon eggs. Every now and then, this character named Sage will teach you another one as a reward, and with that, of course, comes access to many more parts of the world, so it's kind of like that Banjo-Kazooie moveset progression. You get more moves, and then you can do more stuff. Well, may as well show off some of the moves. Uh, you got a basic glide, you know, Spyro style. Nothing to let you soar over the world or nothing, but it will help you get over to distant areas, as long as they're not too high up. Ooh, I also love how letting go of the glide button has him do a nosedive. Really good way to keep up that momentum. Which that roll makes very good use of. Uh, whether you already have some speed or you're just hurtling down a slope, this thing's really good for getting speed and then using that speed to close long gaps, as well as just for getting around in general too. I love how you sink in water when you use it. A lot of these moves are going to, in some way, lean into the physics of the character. So like, uh, uh, for example, timing the tail whip. You can kick yourself off the ground and spread forward. Uh, there's also a horn bounce move you get later on. This doubles as both a ground pound and also a means to gain more height, too. You know what, it kind of feels like a reeled back, multi-purpose version of the tail bounce from Gex. Now that was a satisfying move. I haven't really seen that in uh, games much since, so it's really cool seeing something like that, except with like a new spin on it. Swimming controls are good, too. You can sink like a rock or flutter upwards, both with ease and at a solid pace. Dude, this is why I love playing platformers made by people who grew up loving platformers, because just from experience, they already know what doesn't work, so they're pretty much just doing stuff that does work. The only annoying thing I'd say about this game is the camera clipping. It does nudge through walls a lot, and the flicker it causes can be a little bit visually irritating. I don't know how easy it would be to fix, but I don't know, making the camera less prone to going through the walls, I think that would make the experience a bit more engaging. But I guess it is a good sign when the only thing I can think of criticizing is something Something that could be considered a nitpick, I guess. The actual design here really does speak to an understanding of what made the exploration and level design in Banjo-Tooie work so well. Like Tooie, though, it can be a tad confusing. You are probably going to get lost in this game at least a little bit. Objectives won't be entirely obvious the first time you see them. You really have to wander around and, and just really observe everything. Uh, it's the kind of game where you might return to an area two or three times before you realize, oh, 
oh, I do have everything I need to do this here. And I mean that in a good way, because I've played so many platformers my whole life, and my brain can solve patterns very quickly now. I don't like it when I come into a room and I immediately know what to do. I want things to be less obvious, I want to figure it out, you know? This puzzle here had you dusting off a book and then using the buttons to make the proper constellation viewable from a telescope. Alright, well I guess we're looking for, uh... Hold up, that's... that's freaking Trogdor! Here we have a room underground with all of these crystals. One of them has an egg, but how the hell do I break it open? Oh, wait a minute, one of these is raised. Well, what's above ground? Platforms, again, one raised. You really do have to absorb your surroundings. It can be easy to miss the clues, but the clues are always there. I also really love how much stuff here feels like they're taking really old mechanics we haven't seen in a long time and really trying to think of new ways to use them. The hover boots, for example, pretty much the same ones from Ocarina of Time, but now the hover lasts forever. So now it becomes about walking long distances, searching all around the big room looking for the footing that is higher and higher, with obstacles even placed with the air walking in mind. Damage is handled interestingly, there's no health or lives or anything like that, and enemies will just instead knock you away, but they can really screw you up. You'll have to start the obstacle over, but you won't have to reload the entire area. Some things will straight up kill you though, which is always jarring when it happens, but in those cases, you'll just quickly restart at the room's entrance. I also love this idea that the levels are the dreams of the dragons, so to unlock more, we've got to feed these hungry little guys until they doze off. That's what the mushrooms are for, so grab as many as you can find. Coming back to the hub world and seeing it pop populated more and more with the eggs you've been rescuing is also really satisfying. It feels like your progress in the game is like real, it's tangible, it takes up real space. Again, sort of reminds me of Tui with the uh, how they handled the Jinjos. I guess I'm probably getting a little repetitive with the Tui comparisons, but like if you really loved how Banjo Tui did a lot of that stuff, I really do think you would love Cavern of Dreams. It's really good at that kind of thing, and you know, while you make it lost, it is nowhere near as obnoxiously confused using as Tui tends to get. Don't get too scared when you find the Jolly Roger Bay type level. It will feel like a big maze at first, but you'll soon grow to realize how small the map here really is. You know, it's really cool seeing this game come out alongside Corn Kids because they are both entirely different takes on Banjo's formula, yet they both work so well. It really goes to show that you can absolutely take old kinds of games and still do so many new things with them. And hey, if you are a Switch owner, my dude, you're in luck. This one is on the Nintendo Switch. If it would load, why does the Switch storefront suck ass? Yeah, there it is, okay. <laughs> on Steam as well, obviously. So hey, if you got a Steam Deck, I recommend playing it on the CRT. And the price also isn't half bad, only 13 bucks US, 17 Canadian, and I would say that's well worth it if this is your kind of jam. If they didn't send me a review code, it, this would have been a day one buy for me. So hey, if you're itching for that kind of move set based progression tied to a puzzling world, Cavern of Dreams is an enchanting experience that tickles those fuzzy feelings as well as that Kazooie itch to explore and conquer. I'll be seeing this one in my dreams, that's for sure. And yet again, there's still so many more games I wanted to talk about, but I don't want these videos to get too long, and I don't want them to take too long to make, so uh, you can expect the Volume 3 next year. I, I do want to finally talk about um, Spark, the Electric Jester. I get a lot of comments asking me about those games, and you know, I, I do want to cover more than just new stuff. I want to cover stuff that's been out for a while too, so y you'll probably see that one next year. But for the time being, I hope I was able to get something cool in front of you. Uh, yeah, more and more with every passing year, these are the types of games that I'm finding myself actually really impressed by, so I just want to keep getting them out there. I will have links to the PC versions of all these games down below in the description. Uh, I'll have the itch.io links as well if the game has it, uh, just so you can get the game DRM free if you want. As for console stuff, uh, I'm sure it's probably more convenient to just find it on the storefront. I don't know if the link to that on your phone or computer is going to do much for you, but if enough people do ask about that, I might start including the links to the console versions too. But yeah, man, like it makes me so freaking happy to see stuff like this still getting made. Like, we are long past the dark ages of the 3D platformer. There is so much passion for these types of games still out there, and now we've been so lucky for it to be in the hands of some seriously talented people. And there is still so much to look forward to. Roland Rascal and the Big Catch, just to name a few. The future of 3D platformers is really looking brighter than it ever has before. Actually, if there's any that 
you know about that are worth keeping up with, please let me know in the comment section below because I try as hard as I can to keep up with like as many upcoming indie 3D platformers as I possibly can, but the problem is that they're not always easy to find, right? Like, there's some people out there that are making really cool stuff, but nobody knows about it because they have like a hundred followers, right? So if there's anything like that that you know about, please point the way, buddy, because I want to keep up with this stuff so I can help you guys keep up with this stuff. <laughs> These games are my freaking lifeblood, dude, and there's nothing I love more than get them out there and letting people know about them. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully there was something in here that you'll find really cool or fun to play or interesting in some way. Uh, hopefully you'll look forward to the next one of these, and, uh, yeah, keep on supporting those indie games. Hey, welcome to the funniest part of the video where I go and I go, oh! Hey, if you like what I'm doing here and you would like to support the show, I have a $1 podcast over on Patreon.com. But let's be real, we want good video games to exist, and for that to happen, we have to keep supporting the good games that get made. So buy indie games, and I mean like more than just the ones you see in Nintendo Directs.